send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. It's me again, this is Real Britain with Emily Carver on TV, radio and online. Today we'll be discussing the migrant channel crossings. Almost 5,000 people have arrived on our shores this month alone. This is clearly unsustainable, but what on earth can we do about it? And up in Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon has been accused of whipping up anti-English hatred. I'll be getting stuck into that. Also, journalist and campaigner Jo Bartosz will be keeping me company throughout the show to give her take on this week's biggest stories. But before we get stuck into all of that, it's the news with Tatiana Sanchez. Good afternoon. It is one minute past two. I'm Tatiana Sanchez in the GB Newsroom. Dock workers at one of Britain's busiest ports have gone on strike for eight days from today. Nearly 2,000 union members at the port of Felixstowe in Suffolk are striking for the first time in nearly 30 years. The port handles nearly half of all container freight that travels into Britain. Union workers recently rejected a 7% pay offer from their companies because they say it's too far below the rate of inflation. Head of Corporate Affairs at the Port of Felixstowe, Paul Davey, says the strikes will prove costly for workers. Unite, though, have declined. They refused to put the offer we've made to their members, their 1,900 members. They've had no say in this, and now they're, they're having to go on strike. And that's going to cost each of them, you know, the, the thick end of sort of 1,900, uh, 900, sorry, I should say, 900 pounds each in lost wages. Barristers are voting on plans for an all-out strike next month in a row with the government over jobs and pay. Members of the Criminal Bar Association have already been walking out on alternate weeks in England and Wales. They're now deciding on whether to take uninterrupted industrial action that would start on the 5th of September. The ballot closes at midnight today with the re results expected tomorrow. The Scottish First Minister has said the energy price cap rise must not go ahead as families across the country struggle with the rising cost of living. Nicola Sturgeon warns many families face destitution and devastation if the expected rise goes ahead in October. She's expected to hold a summit with energy bosses and has urged Westminster to work with the Scottish Government to find a solution. A voluntary scheme could help thousands of households with smart meters save on energy bills this winter. It's understood that the National Grid Electricity System Operator will announce plans to pay their customers for easing the strain on power grids at peak times. It says turning off appliances like washing machines and game consoles in the evening could reduce the risk of blackouts and save people up to £6 per week. The electricity generator hopes to have the scheme approved by the end of October. Outgoing Prime Minister Boris Johnson has reportedly approved a multi-billion pound deal for a new nuclear plant in Suffolk. Senior government sources say the choice to build the Sizewell C nuclear reactor happened several weeks ago without telling other ministers. The project will be funded primarily through private investment, but the government is expected to buy a 20% stake in the plant. The UK government's new free trade deal with New Zealand will be damaging to Scottish farmers. That's according to MSPs. The agreement will allow much higher quantities of produce from New Zealand to come into the UK without tariffs. The Scottish ministers warn the measures will cause a disadvantage for domestic farmers and are calling for greater safeguards, similar to the EU's restrictions. The deal will allow for 12,000 tonnes a year of New Zealand beef to come into the UK. In comparison, 
the EU has agreed for just over 3,000 tonnes across all 27 member states. Heavyweight boxer Tyson Fury has called on the government to tackle knife crime after he says his cousin died in an incident last night. Posting on social media, the world champion said knife crime was a pandemic in the UK and he called for higher sentencing for those convicted of carrying a weapon. He also paid tribute to his cousin Rico Burton, wishing him a good place in heaven. The police watchdog is considering whether to investigate Scotland Yard after it emerged officers came into contact with student nurse Oami Davies after she was reported missing. The Met says they were called to an address in Croydon on July the 6th due to concerns over a woman's welfare, but she told them she didn't want help and so they left. The interaction occurred before Essex police handed the missing person case over to the Met on July 23rd. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now it's back to Real Britain with Emily Carver. Thank you, Tatiana. So welcome to Real Britain with me, Emily Carver. I'm sitting in, of course, with Darren Grimes today. Here's what's coming up on the show. Nearly 5,000 migrants have crossed the channel already this month alone. On Wednesday, more than 600 migrants crossed in 12 boats. The Home Office says the rise in channel crossings is unacceptable. But how can we get to grips with this? Then, BBC staff are considering going on strike over plans to merge its domestic and international news channels. BBC News and BBC World News channels are set to close and from April there'll be a new combined service, BBC News. It seems every man and his dog are threatening strike action these days, but do you have sympathy for the BBC workers? Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, has been accused of whipping up anti-English hatred again. This time after an event in Perth turned abusive with Tory activists being egged. That's what we're talking about for the next hour. I'd love to know your thoughts on the channel crossings. How would you like to see the government tackle this issue? It seems to me the government talks a decent game, but it is but is it's pretty much hamstrung when it comes to doing anything meaningful. Of course, not one flight has jetted off to Rwanda yet, has it? Tweet me at GB News if you have any views on how the government can solve this perpetual crisis. It seems to be getting totally unsustainable. Or you can email me on gbviews at gbnews.uk. You can also watch us online on YouTube. And don't forget Facebook. You'll find lots of brilliant content there on the GB News page. Thank you very much. So, are Scottish voters beginning to see through Nicola Sturgeon? According to recent polling by Ipsos, less than one third of Scots now support Nicola's plans for a referendum next autumn. The biggest proportion, 30%, believe there should never be another referendum. You'd think that this might make her think twice. When even SNP voters don't back her referendum plan, surely it's time to put an end to the endless plotting for constitutional chaos. The case for independence is a strong one. It is time to talk about independence. I intend to do everything that is within my power to enable that referendum to happen before the end of 2023. But no, she continues to bang the drum, using any platform and opportunity to continue her tone-deaf obsession with breaking up Britain, tearing up the union and splitting our country apart. Unsurprisingly, the vast majority of people living north of the border would rather their leader concentrate on other issues. 55% think that the First Minister has spent too much time on the issue. You can say that again. At the same time, just 15% of Scots think another referendum is something Holyrood should be focused on right now. Nicola claims she speaks for Scotland. Of course she does. But is she really listening? Unsurprisingly, the economy, health and education top the ranks as the public's main concerns. Yet, in a press release, press release issued to mark a year since the SNP Green Coalition, she shamelessly promoted the development of an independent Scotland and the delivery of a referendum as one of their four top priorities, missing out the cost of living crisis altogether. 
Sturgeon is not stupid. She knows a referendum is Westminster's call. She knows it's not what the Scottish people want right now, yet she continues to press ahead with her unlawful referendum plan. The irony, of course, is that without Westminster to blame for her failures, she'd finally be accountable. Accountable for the fact Scotland is the drug death capital of Europe, accountable for the countless allegations of corruption and incompetence against her government, and of course accountable for the SNP's abysmal record and education. We've seen how Scottish nationalists whip up anti-English sentiment and the venom they spit towards people like the Scottish Young Conservatives and journalists like the BBC's Scotland editor, who was of course called a traitor and scum by a mob of Scottish nationalists. James Cook's predecessor, Sarah Smith, was apparently relieved to leave her job after enduring what she called the misogynistic bile and hatred of covering Scottish politics. Of course, Sturgeon tries to distance herself from this with weasel words, but she's the one responsible for whipping up much of this division. She talks of Scotland being treated like something on the sole of Westminster's shoe. She talks of the Tories undermining Scotland and how Scotland must defend its parliament against the UK government. We all remember how Sturgeon blamed travel across the UK for the number of COVID cases in Scotland. What did she want, a Trumpian style wall? It's hardly surprising that with this kind of rhetoric and the division she's sown between unionists and nationalists, that the xenophobic extremes of the nationalist movement feel emboldened to behave in such a thuggish way. It is a relief that the Scottish people do not want a referendum next year. It is a good thing that people are becoming more aware of the plain nastiness that grips some of the SNP's most loyal supporters. Yet Sturgeon's obsession with independence persists. Nic Nicola claims to represent Scotland, but is she listening? So that's my view. I think it would be disastrous and very sad, actually, if we were split, if the UK was torn apart like Sturgeon wants it to be. But what do you think? Do you think it's time to let Scotland go? Do you think independence would be a disaster? Do you think that Sturgeon is actually responsible for whipping up this hatred or do you think it comes from elsewhere? Let me know. Make sure you tweet me at GB News. We'll be reading out lots of your comments later. Uh, so do let me know. Do email in as well. So moving on. Nearly 5,000 migrants have crossed the English Channel this month. At this rate, the total number of people arriving in the UK on small boats this year will be double last year's tally. The Conservative leadership hopeful spoke to Alistair Stewart about the issue at the GB News hustings in Manchester on Friday. Rishi Sunak told us he's against sending the dinghies back. Here to implement that in the channel and given the boats that we're faced with compared to how the Australians do it where they are. But look, no option should be off the table. But I tend, in the interest of being practical here and not just talking in, in abstract, let me give you two very specific things out of my 10-point plan, which is online for those of you who want to go and have a look at it, that I want to do. The first is very quickly move away from the European definition of what an asylum seeker is. Because it is too broad, it gets exploited by lefty lawyers and means that we can't send people back who shouldn't be here. We can move to a different convention and we should do it as soon as possible. Whilst the Foreign Secretary Liz Truss told us the difficulties we face stopping the channel crossings. The way to solve this issue, and I've talked to a number of my counterparts in, in Europe about this as well, is to find a way of making sure there is a long-term home for people who, who are involved in, in illegal immigration. If it is just simply pushing people back and forward across the channel, we are not going to get that long-term solution. And you know, I've been through this with you know, numerous cross-Whitehall meetings. The real issue is, at present, people are able to get on their phone to the lawyers when they get on a plane and evade Mm. evade being being sent to Rwanda and that is the issue we have to fix and that is about the ECHR. So that's the uh, two leadership contesters views our future prime minister they seem to be talking a good talk but do you believe them and do you think they've got the solution I'll be asking should we leave the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights to get stuck into that debate I'm joined by the director for the Centre for Migration and Economic Prosperity Stephen Wolfe and also UK immigration lawyer Harjib Singh Bangal. Stephen, as I said in my monologue, well, as I said in my intro to this discussion, more like, almost 5,000 migrants have crossed the channel this month. Clearly, that is unsustainable. What do you think the government can actually do? Do you think we have to leave the EHRC, ECHR? 
I think the numbers you're talking about are huge. That so far this year, over 21,000 people will have crossed the channel by small boats, and, and there are others that come still on the backs of lorries. Uh, city the size of 60,000 just across the channel in the past few years alone. So it's unsustainable for the UK because of accommodation issues, the cost that's involved, which is on average about £40,000 per asylum seeker in the first year that they arrive, which means it's going to be closer to £2 billion this year. So when you look at that, the prime minister contenders need to be really strong in their view of wanting to control it. Otherwise, it will continue to grow as we expect it will do. Of course, Rwanda is an important part of the various policy processes that they have in place. But one of the big difficulties I'm, I'm looking at in terms of the research that I do on the reasons that asylum seekers are successful, and we also have to remember last year there was 15,000 that were rejected and still not removed from the country, is that the broader definition of the ECH hall does help them gain uh, certain rights to remain in the UK which are broader than the UN Convention on Refugees. Haja, would you agree that the ECHR is holding back our government from making decisions over this issue? Surely you agree it's unsustainable for this level of immigration, illegal immigration, illegal channel crossings to be taking place? The numbers are huge. and. Um... By the end of the year, we could hit about 35,000. That's up on last year's figures. We've been warning about it all year, but there's been no practical solution. It's very easy to say, we should do this, we should do that. We've been listening to that for the last eight years. But practically, we don't have the infrastructure. The Home Office isn't fit for purpose. Every year, there's a Home Office Select Committee report. It's been saying it for the last five, six years. It's been saying, this machinery is not good enough, called the Home Office. It's not good enough. It does not have the right staff. It does not have the numbers. The decisions made are not correct. 50% of decisions that are appealed are overturned. And more essentially, this has got to do with not about almost processing claims, but about, like Stephen said, removing people after their claims have failed. We don't have this machinery to remove people straight away when we should be removing people. We have detention centres, but we should be able to do the next step. We've, but Harjab, I'm, I'm isn't that... Five... Isn't, sorry to interrupt, but... How can we get that machinery? Because it seems to me that we are hamstrung by uh, lawyers and activists using the legal system to make it near impossible to deport people. No, we need to sign more deals with countries to return people there. Last week, I think the week before, we just signed a deal with Pakistan, um, Pakistan to return people, failed asylum seekers. We have one with India. We have one with Nigeria, Serbia. Um, uh, I think we have five deals. In total, we should have deals for a lot, of, a lot more countries. The speed in which these deals are happening is not good enough. The returns process, waiting for travel documents to return people, waiting for embassies to issue uh, travel documents, in the meantime, keeping them detained for months, sometimes then holding someone for months is unreasonable. They will get bail. And in that instance, they might go skip or they might go missing or they might go underground. We have 1.5 million estimated people without visas or without leave living in the UK, creating a black economy. Right, that they have not gathered here overnight. They've been here over the past 20 years. They've not been removed. For that, slowly, they'll develop rights. They might have kids here who stay then seven years, come under that policy, which comes under human rights. If an illegal immigrant stays here 20 years, he's eligible for a visa that way. They might develop relationships with British citizens, have children, and then stay here, develop friends and families here. They're all in the system as it is, but we fail to identify them. If we do catch them, we fail to remove them. That is the failing of the border force, of the Home Office. That has nothing Stephen, to do with the asylum just sorry, seeker I just need or to... the trafficker. Thank you, Hardim. I just need to bring in Stephen here. I mean, this is surely a massive security risk, having this number of people entering our country illegally. You know, I'm reading here in the, in the Telegraph, over 50 illegal migrants aged 30 and above registered as children on UK arrivals. So they're preventing, they're, they're showing, they're essentially lying to get in this country. And then, as Hajab said, it's so imp difficult to actually remove people. But I'm looking at the numbers and I'm thinking, how on earth could any home office, however brilliant it was, cope with these numbers? Well, the numbers are huge, and uh, I, I agree with very much 
would hardly be said, particularly the numbers involved. There are, are what, approximately 1.5 million people in the asylum system, uh, and lots of people there have not been got their claims correct and not being sent back. And one of the big problems, if not returning them, is even though we get the deals amongst the big three groups or countries that are Iran, which has the most, it was 55,000 since 2001, uh, sorry, 72,000 since uh, 2001, 68,000 Iraqis, and we're looking around 58,000 Afghanistan, Afghanis that have come in that time. And we don't have any deals with those countries, and those countries aren't going to have deals with us to return those people. And so we have to think broadly and more, more, more th uh, thoughtfully about how we deter those who many of them are economic migrants. And that is why Rwanda is quite important. And Haji did link in to some of the important reasons that people claim and get away, from, get, get away with staying for longer. The human rights aspects are all part of the ECHR. They're not about the UN Convention. So the lawyers that are representing them, the NGOs and the charities that are receiving funding from the state, use those clauses, including those, for example, that if they've got a sickness or an illness, that they won't be able to be treated uh, sufficiently in their home state. That's one reason why they argue that they can stay here. These are wrong. And it's not fair on people in Britain yeah, I mean, meanwhile, looking at NHS, looking at NHS waiting lists over here. But Absolutely. Marjab, just to finish, um, just to finish, you know, we hear a lot from well-meaning people that if only we opened up more routes for genuine asylum seekers to enter this country, that this problem would go away, that there wouldn't be people traffickers and so on. But that could potentially, there could potentially be hundreds of millions, if not billions even, of people who would prefer to live in this country opening up more asylum routes, wouldn't that just clog up the system even more? I think we need to get to the key and crux of this matter. The fact is that channel crossings, people are being trafficked. So they're being trafficked, they're being provided a service by people traffickers. In all of the arguments produced by every politician, have we ever heard one said, well, directly, we're going to set up a special SAS unit or a special task force, we're going to pump in millions to that. And actually find these people traffickers. We can find drug smugglers sitting in Colombia and South America who are orchestrating stuff around Europe. We can't find people traffickers who are using the same routes from France to Essex or Kent for the last 20 years. We hear them, Stephen hears them, they come at Dover, Tilbury, same, pose, uh, same ports. Are you trying to tell me somebody is getting a bus for the last 20 years off the same bus stop going to the same destination and we don't know where that bus is or who that person is? We have to get the people traffickers. If you want the drugs business to go away, we go and get the drug dealers. If we want the people smuggling business to go away, we need to get the people traffickers. And remember, there's more money made in people smuggling than there is in drug smuggling. It so just that, seems I think, just the audience needs to know. Hard it just seems watching this. It just seems like we're fighting a fighting a losing battle at the moment. Everything seems to be against this, and it seems to be gunning out of all control. Anyway, thank you very much for joining me. That was the director of the Centre for Migration and Economic Prosperity, Stephen Wolfe, of course, and UK immigration lawyer Harjib Singh Bangal. I must read out something from the Home Office. A spokeswoman has said, the rise in dangerous channel crossings is unacceptable. People should always claim asylum in the first safe country they reach rather than risk their lives and line the pockets of ruthless criminal gangs. Under our new partnership with Rwanda, we are continuing preparation to relocate those who make these unnecessary and illegal journeys. Now, I've got Joe in the studio. Hello, Joe. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I just want to get your thoughts on all that, really. I mean, clearly, the numbers are unsustainable. There are lawyers who are using the European Court of Human Rights to, uh, well, essentially, it does make things like the Rwanda flights near impossible. Do you think that something needs to be done in that respect? I totally appreciate the frustration around the European Court of Human Rights. And in some ways, it is sort of anti-democratic. However, at the same time, when you look at those countries who have briefly left, so Greece briefly left, and Russia left after the invasion of Ukraine, and I don't really think that's the sort of company um, the UK ought to be keeping. So, um, to be honest, um, I think at the moment, seeing as, as times are so uncertain, and we're facing such sort of international strife more generally, I think it would be the worst possible time to consider leaving the 
the EHS. I take that point, but I do think it's just so frustrating for British people just watching, well, their borders don't seem to be secure at all. And you have to think about the national security risk, I do think. Anyway, we must move on. You're with GB News on TV, radio and online. In a moment, we'll be discussing the BBC. Believe it or not, some journalists there are considering going on strike over expected job losses. So do you feel any sympathy for them? Now, though, here's your weather. Dry for many with some clear spells, but outbreaks of drizzle will continue in Wales and southwest England. Let's take a look. Patchy rain and drizzle will spread further inland and across the southwest this evening with mist around the coast of Devon and Cornwall. It will be a warm and humid evening. Southeast England will stay dry with some clear spells. A warm evening here as humidity rises throughout the night. Thick cloud will linger across Wales with some outbreaks of light rain and drizzle at times. There could be some mist and fog around parts of the south coast. Mostly dry end to the day in the Midlands, although there could be a few spots of light rain around Birmingham as the cloud thickens. After a dry and sunny day across much of northern England, it would be a fine evening with plenty of clear spells. Feeling fresh under the clear skies but turning more humid later. Showers in Scotland will gradually ease away this evening, leaving most places dry and clear. Turning chilly after dark as temperatures quickly fall away, there could be one or two showers to end the day in Northern Ireland. But in most places that will stay dry, it will be fairly cloudy in the evenings. A southerly breeze will give a fairly warm and humid night across the south and further north, it will be fresher, but heavy rain will arrive into Northern Ireland in the early hours. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farrow. <laughs> my name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panellists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello, welcome back to Real Britain with me, Emily Carver. So, staff at the BBC have been told that plans to merge its domestic and international news channels will result in 70 jobs being axed in London. The National Union of Journalists is naturally very much opposed to these changes and plans to ballot its members on strike action. Back in July, the BBC's culture editor said... With, with linear TV audiences falling, the BBC is signalling it must take its programming to where those news consumers are now heading. I'm not sure quite exactly what that means, but I think I get the gist. But some workers are said to be reluctant to go on strike, worrying it may put them out of a job. 
Joining me now live is the campaign director of Defund the BBC, Rebecca Ryan. Hi, Rebecca. Thank you very much for joining me. So does this show, this, this potential strike action over this merging of these news channels, does that show just how difficult it is to reform the BBC, perhaps? I think the problem and what this shows is that the BBC has got a serious funding issue because people are switching off in their droves. They're realising they don't need to pay for a TV licence if they only watch on-demand content. And that means that they've got a huge funding problem coming down the line. And what's really interesting is that they've chosen, therefore, to cut back on the one element that really s secures their obligation of, of delivering public service broadcasting. And if they're not producing local news for the, for the British people, then they're not delivering on that obligation, which entitles them to be funded by taxpayers, essentially, which is what the licence fee is. So, you know, the, it's like they want to have their cake and eat it. If they're going to cut back on, on the news, and maybe this is an admission that they have a real problem with bias at BBC News, they're going to cut back on that. And then they're just, what are they going to be churning out? They're just going to be churning out woke content that nobody wants to see. And they're going to be churning out, you know, strictly and, and other repeats, you know, and, and where is the value for money? And, and then that doesn't give them the right to tax British people. Yeah, you're right. It does seem very strange that they would target the news services uh, for, you know, cutting down, making savings, because that is what a lot of people say the BBC does best. And it's known for being unbiased in the world and providing that coverage that other outlets uh, either can't afford to because they might make a loss or just aren't willing to. Um, and it's something that the BBC does well. Why do you think they might be choosing that over, let's say, some of their general entertainment shows? Well, I think they, they're stuck in, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place, aren't they, where they're determined to, to secure viewing figures in order to justify the continuation of the licence fee. But actually, if you look at their charter obligations, they have to be producing public sector broadcasting, public, public service broadcasting, which means, first and foremost, top quality journalism and news. And for them to cut back on that first is really quite telling. Um, but I think that, they, that, that their view is probably that most people aren't aware that that is their obligation and they'd rather just keep the viewing figures up. So, you know, if they focus on things like Strictly, which they shouldn't actually be doing anyway, because that should all be being done by ITV and Channel 4, Channel 5, those kinds of channels. Um, then they wouldn't have the viewing figures. So they're yeah, absolutely uh, trapped between a rock and a hard place. Yeah, I wonder where we go from here, because in my view, if we're not going to change the funding model of the BBC, streamlining it should be the priority. As you say, there's so much, so many repeats on the BBC. There's so much um, programming that can be done the same, if not better. Yeah. We have so many different radio stations that crowds out the private sector. It's almost impossible to have, you know, set up a local radio station because the BBC is already there uh, with a station yeah. plus a podcast, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Absolutely. This is the thing. Yeah, they need to be streamlining that offer, which is actually not uh, delivering on their obligations under the Charter. All it's doing is trying to maintain their monopoly. Um, as you say, with, we only have to look at local radio. There used to be so many more independent local radio stations that have now been just forced out um, of the marketplace by the BBC. Um, and, you know, podcast is absolutely indicative of that. There's an, absolutely no reason why you would have podcasts uh, from the BBC, because... They're a, a means of communicating with people. If you're sort of a small independent, you don't have the budget behind you to be doing radio. Um, so all of those things certainly should be cut back straight away, way before BBC News. Um, and like you say, all of these additional channels that they've got um, and all of the repeats, all of those things should be stripped right back. If they can't afford, if they, you know, if they're having to make cutbacks based on their current funding model, then they should cut back all of those additional elements. Yeah, I don't think I've seen some of the podcasts that are put out, particularly on the Young People channels, and they are pretty, pretty, pretty awful. Anyway, thank you so much for joining me. That was campaign director of Defund the BBC, Rebecca Ryan. So plenty more to come this afternoon on Real Britain. Next, we'll be discussing concerns that the effects of lockdown are now killing more people than the virus ever did itself. But is there more to this than meets the eye? First, here's your headlines. Good afternoon. It is 2.33. I'm Tatiana Sanchez in the GB Newsroom.
For the first time in three decades, dock workers at Britain's busiest port have gone on strike in a dispute over pay. Nearly 2,000 union members at Felixstowe in Suffolk are walking out for eight days. The port handles nearly half of all container freight that travels into Britain. Barristers are voting on plans for an all-out strike next month in a row with the government over jobs and pay. Members of the Criminal Bar Association have already been walking out on alternate weeks in England and Wales. They're now deciding on whether to take uninterrupted industrial action that would start on the 5th of September. Heavyweight boxer Tyson Fury has called on the government to tackle knife crime after he says his cousin died in an incident last night. Posting on social media, the world champion said knife crime was a pandemic in the UK and he called for higher sentencing for those convicted of carrying a weapon. He also paid tribute to his cousin Rico Burton, wishing him a good place in heaven. The police watchdog is considering whether to investigate Scotland Yard after it emerged officers came into contact with student nurse Owami Davies after she was reported missing. The Met says they were called to an address in Croydon on July the 6th due to concerns over a woman's welfare. But she told them she didn't want help and so they left. The interaction occurred before Essex police handed the missing person case over to the Met on July 23rd. TV online and DAB Plus radio, this is GB News. Don't go anywhere. Emily's back in a moment. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. So in the break, I received a little bit of paper which has some of your views. Lots of you have been getting in touch today, particularly about uh, Nicola Sturgeon on that subject of yet another independence referendum. That's what she wants anyway. Alan says, Sturgeon has been spewing out anti-English bile for years. She is a xenophobe on a one-track road. Strong stuff from Alan, but I think there, you know, there's more than an element of truth to that. The anti-English stuff, she just seems to get away with it. And you have people in this country, in England, you know, supporting her for God knows what reason anyway. John agrees. He also says, I'm disgusted by and deplore the racism that Sturgeon generates. She does not speak for the majority up here in Scotland. The voting system got her to where she is and she is propped up by the Greens. Pretty accurate assessment, I think. Um, you know, I've got family up in Scotland. I'm half Scottish myself and Nicola Sturgeon certainly does not speak 
for a lot of my family, that's for sure. And it's so nasty the way that we... <laughs> she seems to have divided people into nationalists versus unionists. That's not helpful. You know, it's like Brexit again. Anyway, Paul makes the case for the union. He says, Britain is so much greater than the sum of her parts. The time has come to challenge and defeat the SNP. As Lord David Frost has said, it's time to stop appeasing them and start to fight them by extolling the greatness of our union. And that's the thing. You know, Nicola Sturgeon, she said about Lord David Frost's article in The Telegraph that he was trying to backtrack on devolution, that he doesn't respect Scottish rights, um, and so on and so forth. But I'm sorry, he's just trying to make the case, in my view, make the positive case for the union. Surely that is, well, of course it's his right, but that's a nice thing to do, you know? It's not a nasty, xenophobic thing to do, unlike Nicola Sturgeon, who just wants to rip Scotland apart from us. And then Peter, he's talking about migration, what we were talking about, whether we should leave the ECHR. He says, how are these illegal immigrants having their human rights abused? We are looking at all their claims, but doing this in a neutral country by sending them off to an offshore processing centre might slow the rate down or stop it altogether. Getting out of the ECHR is important, but not essential as these people are not having their rights taken away. Well, we've seen, you know, that's the ECHR was one of the main reasons why the Rwanda flights didn't go ahead. Whether that's a decent plan anyway, I'm not sure. I mean, Joe, you're not too keen on the Rwanda flights, are you? No. No, I'm not. Explain I, why. <laughs> I mean, it's, it does seem like a bit of a last-ditch attempt to do something about it, but, you know, the public are fed up. I totally understand the frustration, but that did strike me as um, uh, death throes of Boris Johnson's administration, really. I think he was sort of throwing red meat to the to the right of the party, and um, and I don't think I, mean, I, I don't believe that the government hadn't hadn't appreciated that uh, that they would be challenged on that. So I think it yes, was, I think they knew that they would be challenged. Yeah. I mean, they warned about it when they were talking about the policy to begin with. Perhaps it was to you know encourage people to think that leaving the ECHR was the solution, perhaps. I don't know. Sunak and Truss obviously have been very, very uh, strong. They've been given, you know, lots of strong words when it comes to dealing with this situation. But I'm not sure anyone believes them at this point. You know, we've seen Pretty Patel struggle with this issue for so long. I mean, do you at home actually think we're going to sort this issue out? You know, I read today that potentially by 2027, there'll be 250,000 of these illegal crossings. I mean, that is just insane. That's not... A sovereign country can't, can't cope with that. So, you know, something needs to be done. But whether soon I can trust have the uh, confidence to do so, we shall see. Anyway, moving on to something depressing as well. According to the Office for National Statistics, 1,000 more people than usual are dying every week from conditions unrelated to COVID. This has led to claims that the impact of lockdown is causing more deaths than the virus itself. With me now to break this down further is the independent statistician and political commentator, Jamie Jenkins. Jamie, I've been seeing on Twitter and elsewhere that you've been crunching the numbers on this. Can we actually draw any conclusions or are those blaming lockdown getting a little bit ahead of themselves? Yeah, good afternoon, Emily. I think um, when we talk about is the lockdowns killing more than COVID itself? I think what people are considering there is kind of the more recent weeks that we've been seeing across the country. We're not talking about since the start of the pandemic. We've had huge numbers of COVID deaths in that first wave of COVID and then at the back end of kind of 2020 going into 2021. Um, and what we're seeing, I've been looking at the numbers and I've been tweeting about them for, for several months myself, is that what you can do when you get excess deaths, you compare the number of deaths you see in the country now to what we were seeing pre-pandemic. And actually, uh, I've been looking at it over the last 24 hours. And, and what we actually have got is that we've got an aging population across the, the UK as well. So we've got more older people than what we had pre-pandemic as well so what that means is that because you've got more older people if the death rates were exactly the same you would expect more deaths and, and i reckon we probably should be expecting at least about 880 more deaths than what you would have had before the pandemic just because we've got a lot more older people in particular a large cohort were born after the second world war and they're now hitting the ages of like 76 77 so so it's not surprising we've got more deaths now what you can do also do there, though, Emily, is look at what deaths you would expect to see by looking at the death rates. And it's quite clear that at the moment, for the last 10, 11 weeks, 
whilst the NHS have had an A&E crisis, we've had ambulances stuck outside of hospital, we are seeing more deaths than we would expect. And this is predominantly in people aged 30 to 59. And, and we can look at some of the causes of all of this. And uh, it's linked to kind of heart problems, so heart attacks, strokes, diabetes, so perhaps diabetes checks haven't been happening. So there is some strong evidence that we are seeing over the last two or three months people dying, and that could be because they've stayed away from the NHS over the last couple of years, and that's caught up now, and, and sadly they're dying. Do you have any idea, or can you predict, or have you seen any, any information about how the current issues within the NHS might impact death rates? Because we're seeing waiting lists reaching, the IFS has said they could reach 14 million um, by next year, I think is what they've said. Um, you know, we see deferred treatments, as you've mentioned, misdiagnoses. Do we have an idea of what the impact might be further down the line, even if it's not to blame for the excess deaths right now? So I think we, we probably are getting some of the excess right now because of the problems in the NHS. We've got about 13,000 patients in English hospitals now who are in beds, who are fit to discharge, but we don't have the, the care in the community them to leave. What that means is the people who are in accident emergency, they can't then be moved to more general hospital. And that then means that there's no beds in A&E. And then you get ambulances turning up and they can't discharge the patient into the hospital. And you're getting stories now of patients in ambulances outside hospitals. So then say you'll have a heart attack outside then in the community, you phone for an ambulance and there's fewer ambulances for you. And we know if you don't get to the hospital quick enough, you are going to die. So I think the current system is probably causing a lot of these over expectation, over the number of deaths, over what you'd expect. Now, longer term, we are seeing increased waiting lists. Remember, a lot of those are for minor things. So people looking for hip operations, things are not going to be critically going to be looking at killing people immediately. But there's going to be those issues, I think, Emily, around people who've missed the cancer diagnosis. Mm. If we've missed cancer diagnosis and that doesn't happen until quite late, people will be dying because of that. So I think, you know, the Department of Health have called for an investigation on all of this. I think we do need to fully understand this so we don't make the same mistakes in the future of what we've done in the past. Yeah, and it's not just misdiagnoses, is it? Because yesterday I was talking about some of the, well, pretty devastating statistics about the misuse of alcohol and the misuse of drugs during the pandemic and the number of people who may have been heavy drinkers to begin with, but then it spiralled as a result of solitary drinking, being locked in your home. It's hardly surprising that problem drinkers then, you know, um, drank more because of the hideous situation that we all were in. That's the sort of thing that will take time to feed through, but really could be devastating for social care services as well as, uh, as, well as hospitals. No, indeed, we, we've seen kind of the, looking at the levels of harmful drinking through the pandemic that has gone up with the pubs being closed. People might think, well, surely would have gone down. And, and people who were kind of light drinkers, they did cut their intake. But those kind of people who are more moderate to heavy drinkers, they increased their alcohol intake. It's a lot easier to go to the kitchen, go to the fridge and pour a very large glass of wine or some more spirits. And we did see that. You're not immediately going to probably see the effects in the, the immediate year or so afterwards. Longer term, this will build up in terms of issues. We are starting to see that impact as well, which is exactly what you've said. So I think the, you know, the harms of locking down and not just the lockdown itself, we were told to stay at home, protect the NHS. There's calls already to not go to A&E in, in this winter unless you really need to see it. And the government constantly saying, avoid the NHS, stay at home. People are doing that. They're not getting seen and they can't diagnose themselves. They've got to see somebody. And ultimately, the NHS is not fit for purpose. It hasn't got the capacity to cope. And we're going to add them to another crisis this winter, like we were pre-pandemic every single winter as well. Thank you very much, Jamie. That was really, really informative. I'm sure people at home found that very insightful and useful to go through the stats like that. That was, of course, the independent statistician and political commentator, Jamie Jenkins. Joe, I mean, it's devastating the impact of lockdown, no whether problem. it's responsible for these excess deaths or not. Yeah, indeed. And I think we're sort of particularly the impact on children has been um, has been really concerning. So, you know, we've seen speech and language development problems because mm. of masks. We've seen lowered immunity because children weren't able to socialise in, in nurseries um, and obviously a massive surge in mental health problems. So I think at every level, um, sort of the system, if you like, is being clogged up. And it was it was quite brutal. Um, 
arguably, you know, you can, you can understand this sort of knee-jerk reaction, but I don't think the social or human consequences were really thought through. Yeah, I think we'll be living with them for, well, many years, I'm sure. Anyway, we must move on. So, back to what I monologued on. The First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, has been accused of whipping up anti-English hatred. The BBC journalist James Cook was called a traitor and scum by pro-independence activists outside the Conservative Party leadership hustings in Perth this week. He was called many other things as well, I'm sure. Um, Conservative Party activists were also pelted with eggs and even spat on. Here is a taster of the event. <laughs> So, Nicola Sturgeon responded by saying, while she condemned the abuse, she was not responsible for the behaviour of pro-independence supporters. Hmm. Joining me now to discuss is the political editor of the Scottish Daily Mail, Michael Blackley, who was at the hustings. Hi, Michael. Did you share hi, a... Uh, hi, hi. Did you share uh, the experience of those BBC journalists when you're reporting in Scotland for the Daily Mail? Yes, I was along at the Perth hustings for the, the Tory leadership contest. And there's absolutely no question when, when people were showing up at the, the event, they did need to run something of a gauntlet of hate. Uh, there, was, there was a lot of abuse from the, the protesters who were outside the Perth concert hall where the, the venue was taking place. And it was some pretty horrible stories that I heard of uh, even uh, pensioners, uh, women, people on wheelchairs were among those who who were were getting pelted by eggs um, and getting all sorts of things like Tory scum chanted at them. So it really was a pretty unedifying scene on on Tuesday night, and the sort of thing that does absolutely no benefit to the cause of Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP's pursuit of of independence. I think it's fair to lay the blame at Nicola Sturgeon's door. Well, interestingly, there was a one of one of the people that was talking about this issue was jo Joanna Cherry, the SNP MP, and she was quite critical of the, the abuse that was taking place. And she actually said herself that she felt that there was this was a, a result of a failure of leadership. So there's no question. I mean, ever since the years running up to the independence referendum. There has been an element within the pro-independence campaign that is extremely abusive towards opponents. And I have no doubt that Nicola Sturgeon does not like those sections of, of the independence campaign acting like that. I, I don't think that can be questioned. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon does try to portray the independence campaign as civic and joyous, and she tries to distance her, herself from other nationalist movements. Indeed, I remember her only a few years ago saying that at some, some point she regrets that there even is the word national in the Scottish National Party uh, name itself. So th there's no question that she tries to distance herself from these elements. She doesn't think that it's beneficial to her cause. But at the same time, a lot of people say that uh, she, she hasn't done enough to crack down on this. Everyone knows about these elements within the nationalist movement. And I think a lot of people think that there maybe should be a much stronger leadership in calling them out and suspending their membership if they're, if they're ever discovered to be SNP members. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it may be the case that in some parts of Scotland, it's uh, a bit uncomfortable now to say you're a unionist, I imagine. Anyway, we've got to Move on. Thank you very much, Michael, for uh, giving us that insight from Scotland. That was the political editor of the Scottish Daily Mail, of course, Michael Blackley. Now, I've heard it on the vape vine that a new pilot scheme has found smokers could be helped to stop if the NHS offered them free vouchers for a vaping starter kit. The University of East Anglia found that 42% of smokers who spent a £25 voucher at a vape shop were not smoking four weeks later. That's pretty good going. But is vaping a healthier, alter healthier alternative, or is this just replacing one bad habit with another? Joining me now to discuss this is the Director General of the UK Vaping Industry Association, John Dunn, and GP Mokaki. John, presum presumably you welcome the findings of this study. 
Absolutely. And it's something that the industry and, and many in the medical community already know. Vaping is now the most successful um, way for people in the UK to quit smoking. It's twice as successful as all of the other NRT products combined. But this is great leadership, I think, from East Anglia and also from Smoke Free Norfolk. And I think what's important now is that the lessons learned here are replicated in other stop smoking centres around the country. Because currently only about 45% of stop smoking centres in the UK actually offer vaping as part of their toolkit. Mo, I must say I have a little bit of skin in the game when it comes to this because I myself do use an e-cigarette. I'm not sure if that's the same as a vape, but I guess it does the same trick. And it is far, far better than uh, stinking of cigarettes and, uh, and hopefully much more healthy for you. Do you think vapes aren't the answer to quitting smoking? Do you think that we should encourage the use of them, the NHS should do so? Well, I think it's really important to recognise that vapes were brought in way to help us to cut down smoking. We know that smoking has such a devastating effect on so many parts of our body. We know, of course, that it affects the lungs, the heart, um, the circulation, but also the risks of cancer and other things associated. So we know that stopping smoking is a really, really key part to improving your health. And vaping actually provides a really good way of stepping down from smoking. So you're still getting that nicotine that your body creates and, and craves, sorry, but you're actually now removing most of those tars and toxins and, and, and dangerous substances. So I think this study is quite welcome in many ways because we see that we can have some evidence that those hardest to reach, those hardest to treat, those who are suffering the most actually improved a lot. You know, 40% is a huge improvement. Um, and of course, there's some money saving as well. So I think this is a, a really welcome finding and perhaps something that we can start looking at implementing a bit further afield. Well, there we go. It might be a little bit expensive, though, uh, Joe, don't you think? Or would it not be? Sorry, not Joe, John. I'm so sorry. My autocue said Joe there. Sorry, John Dunn. Um, but yes, it might be a little bit expensive, but also just quickly while I've got you, I'm a bit worried about these elf bars. You know, I'm quite socially liberal. I'm not really into the nanny state and that sort of thing. But these elf bars are clearly designed for children, are they not? They're neon coloured. You can get them in all tutti frutti flavours. What do you make of them? Absolutely not. Disposables have been around for about 12 years now. All that's changed is the design. They've become a lot more popular, mainly because of regulation changes in the US. But the, the, the devices themselves are still very simple. And what they are is they're, they're a, uh, an easy to use product. They're a low cost um, entry point into vaping. And as you said, vaping can be expensive when you get into the larger devices. But when you consider what these people are spending on cigarettes, it's still far cheaper to vape than it is to smoke. Yeah, Mo, is just a question that I want to know the answer to, Mo, is, is nicotine in and of itself dangerous for you to be addicted to? No. Um, nicotine, we have nicotine receptors in our body. Um, so nicotine receptors do various things within the body. The thing about smoking is that they activate the nicotine receptors. And when that happens, they increase the production of them. So as soon as you start smoking, you produce more nicotine receptors. And then when you're not smoking, the body gets signals from them saying, I want more, I want more, and it sends signals. So you think, oh God, I really need to smoke. And this is why it becomes so addictive. Vaping takes away all of the toxins, but actually uh, gives you that nicotine. So you're still not getting those cravings, but you're able to um, avoid the harmful substances. I think what's interesting is what you said recently about um, the, the sort of vaping that's aimed at, at sort of the younger market. I think John and I have been on to discuss this before because one thing that's really important is regulation. And I think this is the key element that we have to be very vigilant of. You know, um, the, the vaping industry has been well regulated, but we've seen recently in the last few weeks and months is that there are a lot of these products aimed at children. They look nice, they look uh, colorful, as you said, they have lovely flavors, but they're unregulated. They're from illegal areas, but they're flooding the market. And actually what's happening is children are being encouraged to smoke these. And these aren't the ones that just have nicotine. These have other noxious and dangerous substances. So I think that's something that we have to continue to look at. There must be more work to prevent that happening. 
but otherwise, you know, I think this is a, a welcome step um, in terms of stopping people from smoking and eventually mm. stopping vaping altogether. Well, I guess, I mean, it is already illegal to sell vaping products to under 18, so perhaps that should just simply be enforced more. I don't know what the answer is. Anyway, thank you both for joining me to discuss vaping. That was the Director General of the UK Vaping Industry Association, John Dunn, and GP Mo Kaki from his car. So you're watching Real Britain with me, Emily Carver, standing in for the lovely Darren Grimes, who I believe is actually in Dubai. Lots coming up, but now it's a short break. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back. This is Real Britain with me, Emily Carver, on your TV, radio and online. This hour, we'll be discussing knife crime. Fewer than a third of knife crime convictions resulted in a prison sentence over the past year. Do we need to get tougher on those who carry a knife? And we'll debate wokeness in the workplace. When did we all become so obsessed with diversity and inclusion? Also, the journalist and campaigner Joe Bartosz is here with me until 4 p.m. But first, it's the news with the lovely Tatiana Sanchez. Thank you very much, Emily. Good afternoon. It is one minute past three. I'm Tatiana Sanchez in the GB Newsroom. Dock workers at one of Britain's busiest ports have gone on strike for eight days from today. Nearly 2,000 union members at the port of Felixstowe in Suffolk are striking for the first time in nearly 30 years. The port handles nearly half of all container freight that travels into Britain. Union workers recently rejected a 7% pay offer from their companies, but they say it's too far below the rate of inflation. Head of Corporate Affairs at the Port of Felixstowe, Paul Davey, says the strikes will prove costly for workers. Unite, though, have declined. They've refused to put the offer we've made to their members, their 1,900 members. They've had no say in this and now they're, they're having to go on strike. And that's going to cost each of them, you know, the, the thick end of sort of 1900, uh, 900, sorry, I should say, 900 pounds each in lost wages. Barristers are voting on plans for an all out strike next month in a row with the government over jobs and pay. Members of the Criminal Bar Association have already been walking out on alternate weeks in England and Wales. They're now deciding on whether to take uninterrupted industrial action that would start on the 5th of September. The ballot closes at midnight today, with the result expected tomorrow. 
The Scottish First Minister has said the energy price cap rise must not go ahead as families across the country struggle with the rising cost of living. Nicola Sturgeon warns many families face destitution and devastation if the expected rise does go ahead in October. She's expected to hold a summit with energy bosses and has urged Westminster to work with the Scottish Government to find a solution. A voluntary scheme could help thousands of households with smart meters save on energy bills this winter. It's understood that the National Grid Electricity System Operator will announce plans to pay their customers for easing the strain on power grids at peak times. It says turning off appliances like washing machines and game consoles in the evening could reduce the risk of blackouts and save people up to £6 per week. The electricity generator hopes to have the scheme approved by the end of October. Outgoing Prime Minister Boris Johnson has reportedly approved a multi-billion pound deal for a new nuclear plant in Suffolk. Senior government sources say the choice to build the Sizewell C nuclear reactor happened several weeks ago without telling other ministers. The project will be funded primarily through private investment, but the government's expected to buy a 20% stake in the plant. The UK government's new free trade deal with New Zealand will be damaging to Scottish farmers, according to MSPs. The agreement will allow much higher quantities of produce from New Zealand to come into the UK without tariffs, but Scottish ministers warn the measures will cause a disadvantage for domestic farmers and are calling for greater safeguards similar to the EU's restrictions. The deal will allow for 12,000 tonnes of a year of New Zealand beef to come into the UK. In comparison, the EU has agreed for just over 3,000 tonnes across all 27 member states. Heavyweight boxer Tyson Fury has called on the government to tackle knife crime after he says his cousin died in an incident last night. Posting on social media, the world champion said knife crime was a pandemic in the UK and he called for higher sentencing for those convicted of carrying a weapon. He also paid tribute to his cousin Rico Burton, wishing him a good place in heaven. The police watchdog is considering whether to investigate Scotland Yard after it emerged officers came into contact with student nurse Owami Davies after she was reported missing. The Met Police says they were called to an address in Croydon on July the 6th due to concerns over a woman's welfare, but she told them she didn't want help and so they left. The interaction occurred before Essex Police handed the missing person case over to the Met on July 23rd. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now it's back to Real Britain with Emily Carver. Thank you, Tatiana. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Emily Carver. Here's what's coming up on the show. Fewer than a third of knife crime convictions resulted in a prison sentence over the past year. So is the deterrent really strong enough? We'll also take a health check on the Labour Party, Labour Party too. They lost about 91,000 members last year, but they hold their biggest poll lead over the Conservatives for almost 10 years, thanks in part to the government's handling of the cost of living crisis. And finally, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle reportedly won't meet with the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge when they return to the UK next month. I, for one, hope that Prince William and Harry can resolve their issues soon. That's what we're talking about for the next hour. I'd love to know your thoughts on how we should tackle knife crime. Is it a problem in your area? Tweet me at GB News or you can email me on gbviews at gbnews.uk. You can also watch us online too on YouTube and don't forget Facebook where you'll find lots of brilliant content on the GB News page. Thank you very much. Right, now we're going to be talking about a very serious issue, the plague of our streets, knife crime. The nation was shocked this week when 87-year-old Thomas O'Halloran was stabbed and killed in London while riding his mobility scooter. It comes as new figures show that fewer than a third of knife crime convictions resulted in a prison sentence over the past year, and 64% received either no penalty at all, a caution, a fine, 
or a community or suspended sentence. So how do we end knife crime on our streets? With me now to discuss this further is former detective superintendent at the Met Police, Shabnam Chowdhury, and the CEO of the Dwayne Simpson Foundation, Lorraine Jones Burrell. Thank you so much both for joining me. Lorraine, tell me a bit about your organisation. You lost your son, I believe, to knife crime not too long ago. Is your organisation there to raise awareness? Um, not just raise awareness, but actually help to deter uh, young people away from from gangs and uh, helping them to make better choices through the, the multiple challenges that they have in the community. We're working with children from the age of five years uh, right up until um, 21. I mean, we're an amateur boxing club, Dwayne Amix, ABC. And uh, I, I didn't know anything about boxing before Dwayne was killed. It was Dwayne that started the boxing club. And it was the young people that literally pleaded with me and said, look, mom, there's nothing in the community that can help us the way we need to be intervene intervened with. So I started it up. We've been going for seven years now, Emily. Um, we've actually got our head coach, Danny Shannon. He's a, he's a, a police officer. And the, the interaction with the young people and, and the police is absolutely phenomenal. And they get to tell us the challenges that they're faced with in the community, which is not, it, it goes as far as in the home. Mm. So as much as I do want tougher sentencing, because my son's killer only got six years, 12 years, he's done six, he's enjoying his life now, we're broken. But what happens in the prisons? What about the restorative justice? What about those that, we want to prevent them from getting to that stage of carrying a knife and then taking a life. And that's what's happening. You've spoken about how, I think I've seen in the press anyway, how you've spoken about female relatives need to speak up and talk about their concerns in the community before it gets to this stage where children essentially are harming each other in this way. What do you think is going on at that family level that can be fixed? What, can we, what needs to happen in communities where knife crime is, is so prevalent? There's a lot of poverty, a lot of deprivation, young people being hungry. I've gone into the prisons, I've spoken to even perpetrators, and the, they all say the reason why they've got into selling drugs is because they want a better life for themselves and their family. It's a financial issue. They all say that. I've spoken to killers that have killed other people and they say that they regret what they've done they wish they didn't do it at that spare of the moment, the rage, because they've been dealing with so much anger and mental illness. And that is something which is happening a lot, especially with people of colour that are living in poverty, deprived areas. They go through a lot of stress, anxiety and mental illness. And when you're Going through mental illness, you're not at your best and you make poor choices. So in the home, there's a lot going on. And that's why I really, really think that if we're going to talk about knife crime, which is the consequence of deeper issues, we have to look at the intervention mm. in the home and with those young people or uh, uh, young men, women, that are not living at home but are dealing with the pressures of society, look at inflation now. Mm. Shabnam, uh, besides from the social issues that lead to knife crime and lead to violence among mostly youths, um, what do you think we need to get tougher when it comes to police and enforcing the law? You know, I spoke, yet, I spoke earlier about how fewer than a third of all knife crime convictions result in a prison sentence. Is that too low? Uh, well, definitely. What that basically does is undermines all the work that the police officers are actually doing. There's nothing there that I disagree with, with Pastor Lorraine. She won't remember me, but we've sat in many meetings at Scotland Yard um, back in 2018, 2017. So I, I really do agree with pretty much everything she says. But when you've got police officers who are working hard, who are going out and taking knives off young people, that's one thing. When you're then taking them through the court processes and the judges clearly feel that this is low level crime and it doesn't have an impact on society, what they're doing is they're releasing those individuals back out into society without any support really, any form of opportunities for training, for redirection, to mm. give them an opportunity to go somewhere else and do something else that 
that gives them a better opportunity in life. It just puts them back straight back out on the street and to continue to either be involved in crime, gang related, drugs. And kids don't carry knives just because they are actually involved in crime. It's because partly it's to do with kudos, partly it's to do with the fact that they want to defend themselves because of what's been going on in a particular area that they're living in, where poverty is a problem, where drugs and gangs are a problem, and they don't want to go from A to B without feeling that they might feel that they'll feel safer with a knife. And most importantly, let's not forget how they're actually getting hold of these knives. We're not talking about bread knives and normal knives that come out of the kitchens. You're talking about zombie knives. You're mm. talking about swords. You're talking about axes, knives that you can only get either online or through purchasing in a shop somewhere where somebody doesn't care who they're selling to. The fact is that they're making money in order to be able to continue with their, their now business this is a, too. Now, this is a question to both of you, really. Shabnam, if you'd like to answer first. Um, Stop and search. It's very controversial because the figures show that more black uh, people are stopped than their white counterparts often. At least I think that's what the statistics have shown in recent years. Do you think that's something we just have to deal with, that the community has to deal with, because in the end it will save lives? The community must get on board with stop and search. I absolutely advocate stop and search. It's a powerful tool, but the police have got to make sure that they use it proportionately, appropriately, that when they are stopping and searching individuals, they're explaining the grounds to them, they're actually explaining why they've actually stopped and searched them, and actually that they're treating them with dignity and respect. Because very and a significant number of kids that are being stopped and searched are disproportionately targeted by police officers because there's racial profiling that goes on. Look, if if it takes a knife off the street, if it actually educates a young person that they don't need to carry a knife, then that's all well and good. But there's got to be a two-way process. Mm. Police and communities and families who get on board with this, but also to make sure that it is proportionate and necessary. Lorraine, is stop and search justified if it prevents one, you know, if it saves one life, if it gets one knife off the street? Well, just like what's been echoed, it's how it's done. I mean, I, I chaired a, a meeting a few weeks ago and I had a, a number of young people there. And a, a young girl s stood up and she said that she's frightened of the police. And we said, why? She said, because it seems that they're abusing their power. Mm -hmm. Why are you saying this? Because of what she has witnessed where some police are... It's like they're abusing their power in how they're conducting stop and search. I'm from Lambeth, and, we, you know, we're doing a lot with our Lambeth police in community engagement where they meet with the youth, they speak about stop and search, the youth are able to say, how is it supposed to be done? They're educated and there's a harmony being built there. But as my, my, my lady has said, it's how it's done. So we're not saying we don't need it. Obviously, I've gone out on, on, on operations and I've seen the mm. zombie killers, the Rambo knives, which they've taken off young people. In fact, I don't know how they even managed to have it in their trousers. Yeah. So we're not saying not at all, but it's so important in how it's done. And like I said, Emily, the intervention happening before it gets to that stage that they're carrying these knives. Well, that's, that's the thing. I mean, I, just on that point, on the stop and search point, I mean, I can't imagine how it is being a young black man going about his everyday business and being pulled over the, by the police to be stopped and searched. Like, that would... Well, that would make you angry. Of course. But, as you say, if it's done in the right way, if it's done with respect, then it has to be an option for the police. It just has to. Um, but you talk about the home and home intervention is one of the issues that we have, a lot of young men not having a role model, not having a male role model often. Not having a role model and just basically seeing the problems that we're being faced in society. I mean, inflation, it's affecting those that are in deprived estates so much. The young person sees the news. They see their mother in distress. They see father is working and they they just about got ends meet. So they go, they feel under pressure that they have to do things. I mean, these young ones, when you speak to them, it's like you're speaking to an adult. 
the amount of pressure that they have, and they shouldn't have that. So it's like more support for young people with their education in the community, community centres being equipped mm -hmm. to be able to support these young people, not just a centre with a couple of things. We need fully equipped centres and finances yeah. that can finance workers to help. So, you know, it's like the, the home, we really need to listen to the young people, to the, the parents, to the school, because the school report things which they see, and there needs to be more social service impact in the public health way. Not yeah. to target anyone, but to support them. There are so many moving, moving parts. Shabnam, just to finish, um, what's the solution from a policing perspective? Look, the police have got to work closer with the community, as uh, Pastor Lorraine has just said. Uh, they've got to be able to listen to what young people are telling them. The art of communication when you're out dealing with stop and search is one of the biggest key issues within policing. Just because you stop someone actually doesn't necessarily mean that you have to um, search them. And I think the first thing, you come back to the parenting of young children. Education starts at home. Now, you mentioned role models. Role models don't necessarily have to come out of the home. They can come from those centres, from the type of places that Lorraine runs in terms of the boxing clubs. There are plenty of role models out there. You just talked on your news um, uh, reading thing about uh, Tyson Fury, who has lost somebody to knife crime. It's people like that who are huge role models who have huge platforms that can come out and they can speak louder and let their voices be heard. And education within the school has got to be better in terms of supporting young children, providing safe environments for them to speak out, to talk about other kids that might be carrying knives who've got a beef with someone and they know that they're going to go out and have a punch up and a knife might be involved. If they can provide those kind of safe environments for young children, it's a good start. Within policing, you've got to be able to collaborate. Neighbourhood policing doesn't mm. exist really, and you've got to get neighbourhood policing back. You've got a new commissioner coming in, you've got Dame Lynn Owens coming in, there's going to be a reform of policing. They're going to look at their operational tactics, and I'm hoping that I'm going to see an increase in neighbourhood policing where you get more than one bobby on the beat, you get a significant number of officers who know their community, who talk to their community, who actually listen to what they're telling them. Thank you very much, Shabnam. Um, it's such an important discussion to have people sitting at home seeing headline after headline of young, mostly men, just, you know, dying at the hands of a, of a, a knife. It's, it's horrendous, and I hope one day we won't have to see that on our streets. Thank you very much. That was the former detective superintendent at the Met Police, Shabnam Chowdhury, and CEO of the Dwayne Simpson Foundation, in the studio with me, Lorraine jones Burrell. So, plenty more to come this afternoon on Real Britain. Next, we'll be discussing the Labour Party. They've had a mixed week after it was revealed they lost about 91,000 members last year but they hold their biggest poll lead over the Conservatives for almost 10 years. But first, let's have a look at the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking dry for many with some clear spells, but outbreaks of drizzle will continue in Wales and southwest England. Let's take a look. Patchy rain and drizzle will spread further inland across the southwest this evening with mist around the coast of Devon and Cornwall. It will be a warm and humid evening. Southeast England will stay dry with some clear spells. A warm evening here as humidity rises throughout the night. Thick cloud will linger across Wales with some outbreaks of light rain and drizzle at times. There could be some mist and fog around parts of the south coast. A mostly dry end to the day in the Midlands, although there could be a few spots of light rain around Birmingham as the cloud thickens. After a dry and sunny day across much of northern England, it will be a fine evening with plenty of clear spells. Feeling fresh under the clear skies but turning more humid later on, showers in Scotland will gradually ease away this evening, leaving most places dry and clear. Turning chilly after dark as temperatures quickly fall away, there could be one or two showers to end the day in Northern Ireland, but most places will stay dry. It will be a fairly cloudy evening. A southerly breeze will give a fairly warm and humid night across the south. Further north, it will be fresher, but heavy rain will arrive into Northern Ireland in the early hours. And that's how the weather's shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning.
Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Join me, Darren Grimes, for Real Britain every Saturday and Sunday from 2pm. A news hour that comes with a trigger warning. Scorching hot opinion with prominent guests saying the unsayable and a little bit of weekend fun thrown in. Unlike other broadcasters, I won't be forgetting what the B in our name stands for. So how are you in for Real Britain Saturday and Sunday from 2pm? Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Emily Carver. So the Labour Party has lost 91,000 of its members in the past year. And there may be some difficulties due to the Unite Union in terms of their finances. The party's biggest donor is threatening to withdraw funding due to Sir Keir Starmer being at odds with their position on striking workers. But there has been some pretty good news for the party as they have their biggest poll lead over the Conservatives for almost 10 years. To go into more detail, I'm joined by the political strategist and commentator John McTurnan. Hi, John. Um, how's it looking for the Labour Party? I mean, it's hardly surprising that they've got a lead when we don't seem to really have a prime minister at the moment. Look, it feels like the best opportunity for Labour uh, since the mid-1990s, to be honest. Uh, Labour's driving the agenda uh, over the, the windfall tax first and now over the capping of the energy price cap, you know, just preventing uh, the price rises happening rather than trying to work out ways to help people after they've uh, had to pay the bills. So that kind of sense of Labour driving the agenda. And I know you said um, we don't really have a government at the moment, and it's true the Prime Minister just keeps going on holiday. But equally, the country's getting a really, really, really good look at its two potential future prime ministers. There's very little political news that's not about the two leadership candidates, about Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss. So I suspect that the uh, poll lead for Labour is made up of a lot of uh, desire, you know, three out of four Tory voters support, a lot of desire for Labour's solution to the energy uh, price, price crisis. Uh, but also, I think it's a lot to do with them getting too much view uh, of what the next prime minister might look like and might think, because I think uh, both Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak are failing to address 
any of the of the crises facing us, whether it is the big ones, the NHS, uh, the cost of living, or whether it's the one you just discussed, uh, which is uh, crime, law and order, knife crime. You know, policing across the country is in is in collapse. Uh, no no confidence amongst the public, and yet, where's the government? Where's the Home Secretary? I think where's it's the, there. Where's, where's the leaders? For me, it's it's frustrating that. Keir Starmer is getting a bounce in the polls, if you're correct, off of his energy proposals, because to me, they don't make economic sense. They're populist left-wing measures. You know, you tax the energy companies more and then you can just slap price controls on them. The taxpayer has to subsidise for tens of billions of pounds. It sounds too good to be true, and that's because economically it is too good to be true, in my view and in many economists' view, I'm sure. But, you know, it's difficult, though, because actually the Labour Party does seem to be just as divided as the Tory party at the moment, you know, particularly over the unions. So you've got the Zara Sultanas, the Nadia Whittams, who are pretty anti-capitalist and who think that every Labour MP should be out there on the picket line. And then Keir Starmer, who's trying to be a bit more centrist. Oh, look, uh, Zara Sultana and Nadia Whittam are hugely talented politicians uh, who I disagree with, but I respect. And look, I think they'll make very, very, very good ministers in, uh, in the incoming Keir Starmer government. Um, and they're on a journey. They've already uh, refused to back Corbyn. So they've kept the parliament, they kept the whip, they stayed inside the Labour Party, they've chosen what they're going to do. But the important, this, this question strikes is really important. You're right. And the Labour Party is not the picket party, it's not the strike party, it's the Labour Party. Formed by trade unions, yes, but formed by trade unions to form governments, not formed by trade unions so they could have additional members of a picket line. And I think Keir Starmer is absolutely right here. Uh, a proper Labour Party is preparing for government and preparing to be a government that governs for the whole country, for business, uh, for competitive markets in which business can operate, but for business as well as unions. Uh, for you know, for workers, but also for the enterprise they work in to be profitable. Because without profitable private enterprise, the eighty-six percent of us who don't work in the public mm. sector wouldn't have a job. Yeah, well, John, John, you said you'd be happy for Zara Sultana and Nadia Whittam to be in the cabinet. Are you sure? Because no, they no, don't no. seem to believe in that at all. They seem to think it's time for system change if their Twitter feeds are uh, anything to go by. These these young MPs in the Labour Party. Do seem to be do seem to act like they're running for student union president rather than you know a serious MP. Surely. Uh, what, one great thing about Zara Sultana is she's found new ways to communicate politics. <laughs> Her TikTok following is massive, and that like is not to be disdained. If young people don't read papers, if young people don't engage, where, where do you get your politics from? So Zara has decided to go to where people get their information and their entertainment from. Put some political in information in there, you know. Uh, she's got many, many more followers, I think, than all Conservative politicians put together. And the point is... We oh, God, John, that's so depressing. John, that depresses me so much because it's just it's sound bites and... And, and, and nonsense, in, in my view. But but I will give it to Keir Starmer. He is, he is getting lots of support at the moment because at least he's got yes. off the fence and he's given a proposal. John, we're going to have to leave it there, but thank you so much for coming on and giving that side. Thank you very much. That was John McTernan, who is a political strategist and commentator. Joe, what do you think? Do you think the Labour Party are, well, making ground because of their proposals on the cost of living, or do you think it's because there's just an absence of leadership at the moment? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm an ex-Labour Party member. I left over their, um, their stance on gender self-identification. Did you? Yeah. That was what uh, broke the camel's back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, to me, it's not, it's not a side issue. To me, it's, it's a very important issue. And to the sort of hundreds of thousands... This of is essentially the women are women yes, debate yeah, yeah. that so they can't have. <laughs> Yes, so that's, um, you know, I think, I think Keir Starmer at one point said it was wrong to say that only women had a cervix, and oh, he's God. refused to stand by um, Rosie Duffield. So, yes, uh, to me, that's not a side issue. I think there are many others who are equally frustrated by the Labour Party's obsession with identity politics rather than actually sort of offering a coherent strategy to get out of the cost of living crisis. Um, I think, I mean, at the moment, you know, the, the Tory party, I mean, they're pretty much having a sort of 
barrel scraping competition. It should not be hard for them. It really should not be hard. And it's, it's such a shame because I think wherever you stand on the political spectrum, to, to lack a coherent, decent opposition is, is such a shame. It's... Yeah, and you know, people like to dismiss the gender debate and say, oh, you know, the Tories are always banging on about what a woman means instead of confronting the cost of living crisis. But to a lot of women, it's pretty important whether your leaders know what a woman is, I would have thought, especially as there are so many dangerous implications of thinking that one can just change their gender like that. Anyway, we must move on. You're with GB News on TV, radio and online. Next, we'll be discussing Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. They'll be returning to the UK next month, but it's reported they will not be reuniting, reun reuniting with the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. Now it's time for a check on the news headlines with Tatiana Sanchez. Thanks, Emily. It's 3.33. I'm Tatiana Sanchez in the GB Newsroom. For the first time in three decades, dock workers at Britain's busiest port have gone on strike in a dispute over pay. Nearly 2,000 union members at Felixstowe in Suffolk are walking out for eight days. The port handles nearly half of all container freight that travels into Britain. Barristers are voting on plans for an all-out strike next month in a row with the government over jobs and pay. Members of the Criminal Bar Association have already been walking out on alternate weeks in England and Wales. They're now deciding on whether to take uninterrupted industrial action that would start on the 5th of September. Heavyweight boxer Tyson Fury has called on the government to tackle knife crime after he says his cousin died in an incident last night. Posting on social media, the world champion said knife crime was a pandemic in the UK and he called for higher sentencing for those convicted of carrying a weapon. He also paid tribute to his cousin Rico Burton, wishing him a good place in heaven. The police watchdog is considering whether to investigate Scotland Yard after it emerged officers came into contact with student nurse Owami Davies after she was reported missing. The Met says they were called to an address in Croydon on July the 6th due to concerns over a woman's welfare, but she told them she didn't want help and they left. The interaction occurred before Essex police handed the missing person case over to the Met on July 23rd. TV online and DAB Plus radio, this is GB News. Don't go anywhere. Emily will be back in a moment. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News.
So, a senior RAF recruitment officer has resigned over claims of pressure to meet diversity targets. The unnamed group captain is reported to have been frustrated that white men were rejected in a bid to recruit more ethnic minorities and women. So, I'm asking, why are we so obsessed with diversity and inclusion in this country? Not just in the military, but in all sectors. Do we need to tackle woke in the workplace, or do you welcome it? I don't mean to sound harsh, but it does seem like, in a lot of places, it is a bit of a job creation scheme, this diversity and inclusion stuff. I'm not sure what actual benefit it achieves. But anyway, joining me now, live, is the General Secretary of the Free Speech Union, Toby Young, and also journalist and broadcaster, Sam Dowler. Thank you both for joining me. Toby, you've looked at this issue a lot. How much has diversity and inclusion grown in the last few years? It seems to be absolutely everywhere. Yes, it's become the kind of official uh, state religion of the public sector. Um, it used to be, you know, the reason people went into civil service jobs was because they had a sense of public service. They wanted to serve the public. Um, but that, for some reason, has begun to fade. That doesn't command people's loyalty anymore. It doesn't excite people. It doesn't give them a sense of meaning and purpose. So now the thing which gives people a sense of vocation, meaning, purpose is to increase diversity, equity and inclusion. It's replaced the public service ethic across the civil service. And it's also gone beyond that too. You see, you know, even in the private sector, in the big four accountancy firms, in big banks like Goldman Sachs, this has become the kind of mission du jour. Um, and, uh, you know, it's reached such, I think, absurd lengths that we saw last week, the RAF has said it doesn't want to recruit any longer, any more white men, because it wants to make the RAF more diverse. I mean, in any field, you would think that meritocracy is important in when it comes to the defense of the realm. I don't suppose the Chinese and Russian air forces are thinking about diversity. They're just recruiting the best people for the job. We face more security threats now than in a generation. So to be prioritizing diversity over the best people for the job, it's not to say that, you know, black men, women can't do the job. They may be very good fighter pilots, but they should have to pass the same test. They should have to reach the same standards as white men. To say you're not going to recruit white men because you're so devoted to diversity, equity and inclusion to the RAF just seems to be the ultimate absurdity. Sam, surely we've gone a bit too far with diversity and inclusion if we're going to ban white men from uh, getting a job in the RAF. That Surely even you think that's gone a bit far. <laughs> Well, first of all, I think it's important to say that it's um, it's a bit of hyperbole with this story because um, the, R the RAF came out straight away and said there was no pause in the Royal Air Force recruitment and no pol new new policy with regards to meeting in-year recruitment requirements. So um, they have said that that isn't true. Um, obviously, them, it all stemmed from um, they had the chief recruitment officer who, who was a woman herself and she resigns. But again, we don't even know her name and we don't know why she did it. Um, of course, um, I would 100%, especially with the military, well, with anything, uh, the best person for the job is, is the right person for the job. But when it comes to the RAF, for example, um, this sort of um, inclusivity is, is vital because they work all over the world. They need, they need to have people from, you know, from all walks of life in order to be able to, you know, 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 what, um, know thine enemy sort of thing. So I think it's very important within the, within the RAF, and I don't think that they will be turning around, uh, sorry, turning away um, recruitable and excellent white men just because of some sort of quota that we don't know even exists. But Toby, isn't this a bit dangerous, this kind of thinking? Because there's some, uh, Sam seems to be making the assumption that if you happen to be black, that means you'll understand exactly what another man who is black is feeling, that you can't, that as a white man, potentially you can't uh, empathise or sympathise with someone of a different colour. You know, don't we need to get to the stage in terms of our multicultural society where we're simply individuals and we're treated as so? Yeah, well, this is one of the kind of paradoxes at the heart of the diversity, equity and inclusion 
philosophy. On the one hand, you know, we're supposed to all be the same. So, you know, there's no reason women shouldn't be fighter pilots, play football, become surgeons and so on and so forth, because they are absolutely, in every important respect, no different to men. But on the other hand, we've got to recruit more women because they're better at understanding women and they can do the job better than men can because women are different. Well, either they're different or they're the same. You can't have it both ways. So, yeah, I think you put your finger on one of the problems. I mean, I think the fundamental assumption behind all this effort to diversify various professions, make them more inclusive, is this idea that Britain is still hamstrung by racism, that if you're a woman or if you're black, you still, you're still in some respects a second class citizen. You don't have the same opportunities as white men. And that just isn't true these days. I mean, of course, there are some obstacles. There are some, some pockets of sexism and racism. But Britain is one of the least racist countries in the world by any metric. If you look at university at Missions. 20% of the people admitted to universities this year are black, Asian, minority, ethnic, whereas they only make up 13% of the overall population of the UK. So they're overrepresented. The, the health service, the health service is constantly advertising these diversity manager jobs for, you know, 50, 60, 70,000 pounds. As though the NHS has a problem with diversity. 30% of the workforce in the NHS is Asian. We don't have a problem with diversity in the NHS. You know, wherever you look, we are one of the most diverse, one of the most equal opportunities nation in the world. The idea idea that we've got a problem and we need to create these diversity cracks to address it. It's just nonsense. Sam, do you think we overestimate the problem of racism and the import and that this leads to ridiculous policies like quotas? You can't have ethnic and quotas on jobs, can you? No, I mean, I like I, as I said, I want to do clarify a point I said earlier. When um, I mean, like, obviously, when it comes to um, languages, speaking speaking languages that you might have to speak in another country in order to blend in and defend us, and you know, spy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that's that sort of diversity is massively important, of course. But I do think, um, in generally with diversity, like the pendulum has to swing one way before it comes back into the middle. I think you know we have we do have scenarios where where, like you said, you know, you're going to have like job job descriptions that on on paper seem ridiculous um so i mean i think it is a it is a case of you know we need to change um the way certain companies work so certain companies i mean like the RF, raf for example a lot of people would think it was just for posh white men but um you know we need to change uh, people's um minds and they and especially with the RF and especially with like with young people for example you want young people going into the military or going into like any kind of job at the moment where, which requires like computer programming or something like that you know using drones etc so which you know which is across the across the board when it comes to diversity and that's that sort of thing you know remains the same across, on all jobs but I'm just saying, I just don't understand how corporations Toby are willing to spend so much money on staff and you know, workshops and initiatives and schemes and various things to do with diversity and inclusion when it doesn't reap any monetary reward. You know, is it is it not a huge amount of waste? Is it just for their PR? Well, um, it's become a massive industry now. So in the US, the diversity industry is worth uh, $8 billion a year. And um, you know, with those sorts of resources, they employ lobbyists to tell company bosses that if they put their workers on unconscious bias training courses, anti-racism courses, uh, that, 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 that they'll produce a happier workforce, that the workforce will make better decisions. If there's less discrimination in the workforce, um, uh, everyone, will, everyone will be better off, the company will make bigger profits. But it, it's actually nonsense. Um, the um, behavioral, um, uh, uh, it, it, was it called the, 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 the nudge unit in the um, used to be part of um, the cabinet office. It's now been spun off, the behavioral insights team. Um, they did some research into the impact of unconscious bias training in particular um, to see if it did reap any long-term rewards. And they discovered that not only does it have 
no impact when it comes to reducing discriminatory behavior within the workplace because it ends up making people think in racial terms, because it tells the white employees that they're privileged in virtue of being white, because it tells the employees of color that they're victims because, uh, because of their skin color, it actually has a negative effect and increases, in some cases, increases the amount of discriminatory behavior in the workplace. So it isn't just that you know when companies go woke, they often end up going broke. But also, they, they don't. These, these programs, these diversity training courses, achieve the opposite of their objective. I'm hoping that as we're coming up to a global recession, one of the few silver linings in that otherwise dark cloud will be that the NHS, the civil service, companies across the sector uh, will think we can't afford any of this woke gobbledygook anymore. Mm. We better focus on delivering decent services. It does seem a bit of a racket, Sam. Just to finish. You must agree that unconscious bias training is a bit naff. You wouldn't want to do it. Be re-educated. Well, I mean, this this is the thing. Um, as you talk about, like, you know, diversity, inclusivity, you know, as a, as a gay white man, like, they're ten a penny these days, so I, <laughs> wouldn't, I wouldn't even uh, get a look in. Um, You're not special, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and I do think, like, I think it's since George Floyd, since Black Lives Matter, since, um, since all of that, like, you know, people mm. need to... I think people do need to relook at some things, but obviously nobody wants to sit in a lesson, especially like if you've got like you know a few a few you know a few people of color in your in your team, and like they they've never said anything about it, and you've never said anything about it, and then suddenly you all have to sit through you know hours of diversity or micro. Nobody wants that, of course, and 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 also and also the people of color would probably be like, oh God, sorry about that. It's nothing to do with us. But it's the same. It's the same. With, it's the same as with everything. It has to like. That has to, a happy medium has to come out of this. So of course it's gone a bit too far to begin with, but I think it will come back into a certain area where whereby you know you you could you might get that sort of training if needs be. If like you know things have been said in the off, in an office environment whereby maybe some people do need to get you know to be relearned, etc. So, but I don't think obviously it, it needs to be across the board because like our guest said, because sometimes it you know it can obviously create a, a scenario where it's you know negative. So I think it should be done yeah. as always. I mean, after the after George Floyd killing, which of course was shocking, the amount of money some of these speakers were uh, getting for an hour, essentially to tell white people why 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 they're inherently racist. I mean, it was just things like ten grand an hour or something like that. Some of these speakers were getting anyway. If that racket ends, I won't be uh, I won't be too disappointed anyway. Thank you so much for uh, joining me. That was Toby Young of the Free Speech Union and, of course, journalist and broadcaster Sam Dowler. Thank you very much. Um, what do you make of that? So this is something I've, I've totally changed my mind on. I used to be very much in favour of um, positive action. Um, oh, did you? Yeah, yeah. So, so just as a way to address what, um, what I thought was sort of systemic injustice yes. within, within systems. Um, now, to be honest, um, I think it can really... Um, I think diversity of thought is actually more important to organisations. And I think reducing people to tick boxes and sort of focusing on what makes us different um, rather than sort of what brings us together can actually be quite um, divisive. Also, it just seems so, so silly as well because, you know, ethnic minorities are often outperforming white people in many ways, you know, in terms of university entrances and all sorts in the education system and so on. Anyway... The RAF spokesman has disputed allegations that they may have paused recruitment of white men. I have to read this out. The spokesman said, there is no pause in Royal Air Force recruitment and no new policy with regards to meeting in-year recruitment requirements. Royal Air Force commanders will not shy away from the challenges we face building a service that attracts and recruits talent from every part of the UK workforce. Even if that is so, I think that was a very valuable discussion about how diversity and inclusion is everywhere. It seems to be one massive job creation scheme. Anyway, moving on. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle have reportedly no plans, reportedly have no plans to meet with the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, that's Kate and William, of course, when they visit the UK next month. It was hoped by some that Harry would use the opportunity to mend the fractured relationship with his brother. Sadly, those ideas have been dashed after sources close to the Sussexes said the trip will focus on their charity work. Delighted to say Caroline Aston, royal commentator and features writer at Majesty magazine, joins me now to discuss this further. Is this a bit of a snub by Harry and Meghan? Well, let's just look at the reality of the situation. Anyone listening to this who's been through a broken relationship in the family, 
a love affair, will know that the first casualty is trust, the mm. capital T. And it has to be said, of course, that trust has completely broken down between the firm, headed by the Queen, Prince William, and, of course, Prince Harry, largely due to the fact that when, I think, in the early days after Mexit, there were some faint leaves of olive being handed out across the Atlantic, anything that was said privately so often was drip-fed onto the press. So I think there's a wariness now on both sides, and maybe, like many other people, I think that perhaps the divide is a little bit too big now to be bridged. Rather sad in this, the 21st anniversary year of the late Princess Diana's death. Yes, now I've been reading quite a lot about Prince Harry and Meghan and how they're going down over in the States. Mm. And do you think that Meghan thought that she might have made more progress in terms of her political career by now? There's been lots saying they haven't managed to choose something to run with, choose a cause, choose something that they can really be passionate about. And of course, they've lost that now. They've, they've essentially less, left the royal family. Mm. It's sad, isn't it, that their USP, their unique selling point, really is the one thing that they preach was so very toxic, royal life, mm. being royal. And I think we've been getting quite a few conflicting messages. I mean, on the one hand, we have them showing up, talking about the environment, about carbon footprints, etc., but doing it by private jet. And they employ, of course, um, Sunshine Sachs, that marvellous image-buffing firm to produce their brand for them. And it's too much dibbing and dabbing. There's too much going on, too much not joined-up handwriting, I think you could say, in what the Sussexes purport to represent. Certainly, Meghan Markle is an extremely ambitious lady who is said to have presidential aspirations. And indeed, she will have found reading, of course, Tom Bauer's book, Revenge, um, mm. perhaps a rather bruising experience, where, of course, he does touch on this and how she definitely has a life plan and appears to be working to put it together. These are difficult times for the Sussexes, though, particularly as the shares in Netflix tank. And, of course, they've lost some of their deals, or at least she certainly has lost her animated series, Pearl. Mm. So going forward, who knows? But don't forget, we're all waiting with bated breath <laughs> for Harry's Pearl All Memoir. Yes, I wanted, to, I wanted to ask about yeah. this very quickly, Caroline. It's been reported that the royal family won't see anything and that potentially there's some grievances over that or some concerns. Is that so? Are they worried about what might be in it? Well, I mean, who can tell? Obviously, it would be nice for the family to meet up, but don't forget the Queen is up at Balmoral. She may have to be in London, of course, on September the 5th, the Sussex's first day here, because that's the day we say goodbye, Boris, and hello, X. Who will it be? Let's wait and see. <laughs> Thank you very much, Caroline. Thanks very much for giving your insight on Meghan and Harry and what they've been up to. So that was the royal commentator and features writer at Majesty, Caroline Aston. So there we go. Now, Joe, are you a fan of Prince Harry and Meghan? Uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm so sorry, but I'm afraid I've just got no um, <laughs> insight into, well, into the royals Well, this whatsoever. is the thing. I mean, I'm fascinated from... It's, it's a bit of a soap opera. It's a soap opera to me. You know, I find it fascinating, the drama, the relationships, the accusations, what could be in the book, what couldn't be, the political aspirations of Meghan, what, whether they're going to make it in the US, whether she'll become the president. There's so many angles to this. Um, but anyway, we're going to have to move on, actually, and end the show, sadly. Thank you very much for joining me, Joe. You've been watching Real Britain with me, Emily Carver. Thank you very much for your company this afternoon. The show is on every Saturday and Sunday at 2 p.m. I'll be back next week, Saturday and Sunday, while Darren suns himself in uh, sunny Dubai. But for now, I'll leave you with the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking dry for many with some clear spells, but outbreaks of drizzle will continue in Wales and southwest England. Let's take a look. Patchy rain and drizzle will spread further inland across the southwest this evening with mist around the coast of Devon and Cornwall. It will be a warm and humid evening. Southeast England will stay dry with some clear spells. A warm evening here as humidity rises throughout the night. 
thick cloud will linger across Wales with some outbreaks of light rain and drizzle at times. There could be some mist and fog around parts of the south coast. A mostly dry end to the day in the Midlands, although there could be a few spots of light rain around Birmingham as the cloud thickens. After a dry and sunny day across much of northern England, it will be a fine evening with plenty of clear spells. Feeling fresh under the clear skies but turning more humid later on, showers in Scotland will gradually ease away this evening, leaving most places dry and clear. Turning chilly after dark as temperatures quickly fall away, there could be one or two showers to end the day in Northern Ireland, but most places will stay dry. It will be a fairly cloudy evening, a southerly breeze will give a fairly warm and humid night across the south. Further north it will be fresher, but heavy rain will arrive into Northern Ireland in the early hours. And that's how the weather's shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. Join my show, Farage, 7pm till 8pm, Monday through Thursday. And there you will get...